Book nine of the Nicomachean Ethics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. The Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Book nine. Chapter one in all friendships however which are of a dissimilar species the analogous as we have already observed equalizes and preserves friendship thus for instance in the political friendship to the shoemaker a retribution is made for his shoes according to their worth and to the weaver and other artificers here therefore a common measure money is employed and to this everything is referred and by this is measured but in the amatory friendship sometimes indeed the lover accuses the object of his love that though he loves her beyond measure he is not beloved in return though if it should so happen he has nothing which can excite love frequently however she who is beloved complains that her lover having formerly promised everything now performs nothing that he had promised but things of this kind happen when the one indeed loves the object of his love on account of pleasure but the other loves her lover on account of utility and these things are not present with both for since the friendship exists on account of these things a dissolution of it takes place when those things are not accomplished which are the final causes of their love for they do not love each other but what each possesses which is not stable hence such also are their friendships viz they are not stable the friendship however which is founded in manners i e virtuous friendship since it exists per se or independent of external circumstances is permanent as we have before observed but friends also disagree when other things happen to them and not those which were the objects of their desire for when a man does not obtain that which he desired it is just as if he obtained nothing thus a certain person promised a harper that he would reward him in proportion to the excellence of his singing but in the morning when the harper demanded the fulfilment of his promise he said that he had returned pleasure for pleasure if therefore this i e pleasure had been the wish of each the harper would have been sufficiently recompensed but if the object of the one was delight and of the other gain and if the object of the one was accomplished but not of the other the compact between them was not well fulfilled for a man will attend to those things of which he is in want and for the sake of them will give what is requisite with respect however to the recompense which ought to be made whether ought it to be estimated by him who gives or by him who receives for he who gives first seems to leave to the receiver what the recompense should be which they say protagoras also did for when he had taught anything he ordered the learner to estimate what appeared to him to be the worth of the knowledge he had gained and he received according to his valuation but in things of this kind to some persons it is sufficient to say quote, sufficient be the price a friend appoints Close quote. those however who having first received money afterwards perform nothing which they had promised to do on account of the excess of magnitude of their promise are deservedly accused for they do not perform what they had agreed to accomplish but the sophists perhaps are compelled to do this because no one would give money for those things which they know these therefore because they do not perform that for which they received a reward are justly blamed with those persons however among whom there is no compact for services performed we have already observed that those who first give to others on their own account are not to be blamed for of this kind is the friendship which is founded in virtue 
retribution also must be made according to deliberate choice for this is the province of a friend and of virtue this conduct likewise as it seems should be adopted by those who are associates in philosophy for the worth of philosophy is not to be measured by money nor can any honour be conferred equivalent to its dignity but perhaps it is sufficient that a recompense as great as possible is made in the same manner as towards the gods and parents where however the gift is not such as this but is conferred with a view to a certain thing i e with a view to some recompense a remuneration perhaps ought especially to be made which to both friends will appear to be according to desert but if this should not happen to take place it may not only appear to be necessary but also to be just that he who first received should determine what is an equal compensation for if as much advantage or pleasure is returned as was received the remuneration will be according to desert for this also appears to take place in traffic and in some places there are laws which forbid any judicial processes respecting voluntary contracts as if it were fit that in communions of this kind there should be no other judge nor any other law but that all differences should be decided by the person in whom trust is reposed and by whom such contracts are used for they think that he who was instructed to estimate the retribution will judge more justly than he who reposed that trust since for the most part those who possess and those who wish to receive anything do not estimate equitably for every one thinks that his own property and what he gives are of great value at the same time however the retribution should be as great as it is determined to be by those who receive the gift perhaps however a thing is not to be estimated to be worth so much as it appeared to its possessor but to be worth as much as he would have estimated it to be before he possessed it chapter two such particulars however as the following are dubious viz whether all things are to be assigned to a father and he is to be obeyed in all things or whether the sick man ought indeed to obey the physician and he who votes for the general of an army ought to give the preference to a man skilled in warlike concerns and in a similar manner whether it is proper to be subservient to a friend rather than to a worthy man and whether remuneration is rather to be made to a benefactor than to an associate if it is impossible to make it to both it is not therefore easy to determine all such particulars accurately for they have many and all various differences in magnitude and parvitude in the beautiful and the necessary but it is not immanifest that not all things are to be given to the same person and that for the most part benefits are rather to be returned to those from whom they were received than gifts are to be bestowed on associates just as it is more proper to return a loan to him from whom it was borrowed than to make a present to an associate perhaps however this must not always be done for if any one should be made a prisoner by robbers it may be inquired whether he who redeems him should be redeemed in his turn be he who he may or whether the price of redemption should be given to him who demands it as his due though he has not been taken prisoner or whether in preference to all these a father ought to be redeemed for it would seem that a man should rather ransom his father than himself universally therefore as we have said a debt ought to be paid but if the donation surpasses in the beautiful or the necessary we should incline to it rather than to the discharge of a debt for sometimes it is not equitable to return a benefit which another person has first conferred when he indeed conferred the benefit knowing that it was bestowed on a worthy man but the retribution will be made to one whom he who is to make it believes to be a depraved man for neither sometimes is a loan to be granted to him who has lent for the one indeed i e the depraved man thinking that he shall receive back what he has lent grants a loan to the worthy man but the other i e 
the worthy man does not expect that what he has lent will be returned by the depraved man whether therefore the thing thus exists in reality the merit of the parties is not equal or whether it does not thus exist but it is fancied that it does they will not appear to act absurdly therefore as it has frequently been observed assertions concerning passions and actions are similarly definite and certain with the things about which they are conversant it is not therefore immanifest that the same things are not to be bestowed on all men nor all things on a father as neither are all things to be sacrificed to jupiter since however different things are to be returned to parents brothers associates and benefactors a retribution is to be made to each of such things as are proper and appropriate and thus indeed men appear to act for they invite their kindred to weddings since the genus of these is common and therefore the actions also which are conversant with this are common for the same reason likewise they think it especially necessary that kindred should be present at funerals but it would seem that it is especially necessary to supply our parents with nutriment because we are their debtors and it is more beautiful to supply with these things the causes of our existence than ourselves honour also is to be paid to parents as to the gods yet not every honour is to be paid to them for neither is the same honour to be paid to a father and a mother nor again to a wise man or to the general of an army but to a father paternal and to a mother maternal honour is to be paid to every elderly man likewise honour is to be paid according to his age by rising from our seat and resigning it to him and by other things of the like kind to associates again and brothers freedom of speech must be granted and a participation in common of all things to kindred also to those of the same tribe to fellow-citizens and to all the rest of mankind we should endeavour to distribute what is appropriate and judiciously determine what pertains to each according to familiarity and virtue or use a judgment therefore may more easily be made respecting those who are of the same genus but in those of a different genus the decision is more difficult we must not however on this account desist but determine as far as circumstances will permit chapter three the dissolution also of friendships is attended with a doubt viz whether friendship is to be dissolved with those who do not continue to be our friends or shall we say that with those who are friends on account of advantage and delight when they no longer possess these it is by no means absurd that the friendship should be dissolved for they were the friends of these things viz of things advantageous and delectable and these failing it is reasonable to suppose that they will no longer be attached to each other he however may be justly accused who loving another person on account of advantage or delight pretends that he loves on account of manners i e virtuously for as we said in the beginning numerous dissensions take place among friends when they are not in reality such friends as they fancy they are when therefore any one is deceived and apprehends that he is beloved on account of his manners though at the same time he does nothing that is virtuous he should blame himself but when he is deceived by the pretensions of the others it is just to accuse the deceiver and more so than those who adulterate money because the improbity pertains to a more honourable thing if however he admits him into his friendship as a good man but he becomes a bad man or should appear to have become a bad man is he still to be beloved or is this not possible since not everything deserves to be beloved but that only which is good neither therefore is a bad man to be beloved nor is it necessary that he should for it is not fit to be a lover of what is depraved nor to be assimilated to a bad man and we have already observed that the similar is a friend to the similar is the friendship therefore to be immediately dissolved or shall we say not with all persons but with those who are incurable on account of their depravity 
for assistance ought rather to be given to the manners of those who are capable of being corrected than to their worldly possessions because this is better and more adapted to friendship he however who dissolves such a friendship will appear not to act at all absurdly for he was not a friend to this man or to a man of this description hence as he cannot restore him being thus changed to virtue he abandons him but if the one indeed continues such as he was at first and the other should become more worthy so as very much to transcend in virtue is the latter still to use the former as a friend or is this not possible this however becomes especially evident in a great interval as in the friendships formed from childhood for if one of these should still remain a child in understanding but the other should be a most excellent man how can they be friends when they are neither addicted to the same pursuits nor delighted and pained with the same things for neither will these be present with them towards each other but without these they cannot be friends for they cannot live together concerning these particulars however we have already spoken shall we say therefore that when the friendship is dissolved the one ought nevertheless so to conduct himself towards the other as if he had never been his friend or is it necessary that he should still retain the memory of their past friendship and as we think it is proper to gratify friends rather than strangers thus also shall we say something must be conceded to former friends on account of pristine friendship when the dissolution of it was not occasioned by an excess of depravity chapter four with respect however to friendly offices and those things by which friendships are defined they seem to proceed from the conduct of a man towards himself for he is defined to be a friend who wishes well to another and performs things which are really or apparently good for his sake or who wishes his friend to exist and live for his sake just as mothers are affected towards their children or friends who for a time are offended with each other others however define a friend to be one who lives with another person and who chooses the same things or mutually grieves and rejoices with him but this also especially happens to mothers by some one of these particulars likewise they define friendship each of these however exists in the worthy man towards himself but they exist in other men so far as they apprehend themselves to be worthy for it seems as we have before observed that virtue and a worthy man are a measure to every one since a worthy man accords with himself and aspires after the same things with his whole soul i e with both the rational and irrational part hence he wishes for himself both real and apparent good and acts conformably to his wishes for it is the province of a worthy man to labour in what is good and this for his own sake since he labours for the sake of his dianoetic part which each of us appears to be i e in which our very essence consists he also wishes that he himself may live and be preserved and especially this part by which he is wise for to a worthy man existence is a good thing every one however wishes well to himself but there is no one who if he should become a different person from what he is would choose having lost his identity that the person into whom he is changed should possess all things for now also god possesses good but he always remains such as he is whatever that may be it would seem however that each of us is that which energizes intellectually or that each of us is principally this such a man also wishes to live with himself since he does this willingly for the remembrance of what he has done is delightful to him and his hopes of what is future are good but such things are delectable he abounds likewise in his dianoetic part with contemplations and he is especially pained and pleased in conjunction with himself for the same thing is always painful and pleasing to him and not a different thing at a different time since as i may say he is without repentance i e he does nothing of which he has occasion to repent since therefore each of these things is present with the worthy man towards himself but he is disposed towards his friends in the same manner as towards himself for a friend is another self this being the case 
the friendship also of these appears to be something, and those with whom these things are present appear to be friends. At present, however, we shall omit the consideration whether or not there can be friendship between a man and himself. But it would seem that there may be friendship between a man and himself when the rational and irrational parts are no longer two things but one thing, through their union and consent, and also because an excess of friendship resembles the regard which a man has for himself. The particulars, likewise, which we have mentioned, are seen to take place among the multitude, though they are depraved characters. Shall we say, therefore, that so far as they are pleasing to themselves, and apprehend themselves to be worthy, so far they participate of these things? For these things are not inherent, nor do they even appear to be inherent in any one of those who are very depraved and wicked. And nearly, indeed, they are not inherent even in those who are merely depraved for they are discordant with themselves and like the incontinent they desire one thing but wish another for they choose delectable things which are noxious instead of those things which appear to them to be good others again through timidity and indolence abstain from doing those things which they think are best for themselves but those by whom many and dreadful deeds are performed and who are hated on account of their depravity fly from life and destroy themselves Depraved men, likewise, search for those with whom they may pass their time, but fly from themselves, for they recollect when they are alone the many crimes they have committed, and expect the evils which are attendant on such wickedness will befall them. But they forget these when they are with others. Possessing, likewise, nothing amiable, they are not affected in a friendly manner towards themselves. Persons, therefore, of this description neither rejoice nor condole with themselves, for their soul is in a state of sedition, and one part of it, indeed, is pained on account of depravity, when it abstains from certain things, but the other part is delighted. And the one part, indeed, draws this, but the other that way, the soul, as it were, being lacerated by sense and reason. If, however, it is not possible for him to be at one and the same time pained and pleased, yet after a short time he is pained that he was pleased and wishes that these delectable things had not befallen him for bad men are full of repentance the bad man therefore does not appear to be disposed in a friendly manner even towards himself because he possesses nothing amiable but if it is very miserable to be in this condition every one should strenuously fly from depravity and endeavour to be worthy for thus a man will be disposed in a friendly manner towards himself, and will become the friend of others. Chapter 5 Benevolence, however, resembles indeed friendship, yet is not friendship, for benevolence may be exerted towards unknown persons, and latently, but friendship cannot. These things, therefore, have been asserted before, but neither is it dilection, for it has not either impulse or appetite, and these are consequent to dilection and dilection indeed subsists in conjunction with custom but benevolence may be suddenly produced thus the spectator sometimes becomes suddenly benevolent towards those who contend for prizes at public solemnities and unite with them in their wishes for success but they do not at all cooperate with them for as we have said they become suddenly benevolent towards them and love them superficially Benevolence, therefore, appears to be the beginning of friendship, just as the pleasure received through the sight is the beginning of love, for no one loves who has not been previously delighted with the form of the beloved object. He, however, who is delighted with this form does not love the more on that account, but his love is then more ardent when he longs for the object of his love when absent and desires her presence. This also it is impossible for men to be friends unless they have been first benevolent. But those who are benevolent only do not on this account love each other the more, for they only wish well to those to whom they are benevolent, but they do not cooperate with them in anything, nor do they endure any molestation for their sake. Hence it may be metaphorically said that benevolence is sluggish friendship, but by length of time and custom it may become friendship yet not that friendship which is founded in utility, nor that which is founded in delight. For benevolence does not subsist on account of these things. 
for he indeed who is benefited distributes benevolence in return for the favors he has received in so doing acting justly but he who wishes prosperity to the actions of any one hoping that through him he shall be enriched does not appear to be benevolent to him but rather to himself as neither is he a friend if he pays attention to him with a view to a certain advantage in short benevolence is produced through virtue and a certain probity when some one appears beautiful or brave or the like to another person in the same manner as we said it was produced towards those who contend for prizes at public solemnities chapter six concord likewise appears to pertain to friendship on which account it is not an agreement in opinion for this indeed may exist between those who are ignorant of each other nor are those said to be concordant who are unanimous about anything as about the celestial bodies for it does not belong to friendship to be concordant about these things but cities are said to be concordant when they are unanimous about things which contribute to the general good and when they deliberately choose the same things and do what has been deemed in common fit to be done men are therefore concordant about practical affairs and of these about such as surpass others in magnitude and which may befall two persons or all men thus cities are in concord when it appears to all citizens that magistrates should be elected or that a warlike compact should be formed with the lacedaemonians or that pittacus should be the archon because he also is willing to accept this office but when each of the citizens wishes to be himself the archon as was the case among the phoenicians then they are in a state of sedition for concord does not consist in each person forming the same conception about a thing whatever that thing may be but when they agree in wishing the same thing to the same person as when the people and worthy men agree in wishing that the most excellent men may govern for thus all the citizens obtain what they desire concord however appears to be political friendship as also it is said to be for it is conversant with what is advantageous and with those things which relate to the purposes of life but a concord of this kind exists among worthy men for these are in concord with themselves and with each other since they are as i may say conversant with the same things for the wishes of men of this description are permanent and do not undergo a flux and reflux like the euripus for their will is directed to things just and advantageous and these they desire in common but bad men cannot be concordant except in a small degree just as they cannot likewise be friends since they desire in things advantageous to have the greater part themselves but in labours and ministrant services they are deficient each however wishing that these things may befall himself he explores how he may prevent others from obtaining that which he desires for concord perishes when justice which is a common good is not preserved it happens therefore that they are in a state of sedition compelling indeed each other but being themselves unwilling to do what is just chapter seven benefactors however appear to love in a greater degree those whom they benefit than those who are benefited do their benefactors and the cause of this is investigated as a thing not conformable to reason to most men therefore the cause appears to be this that these are debtors and those the persons to whom they are indebted hence as in loans debtors wish their creditors not to be in existence but creditors are concerned for the safety of their debtors thus also benefactors wish those whom they have benefited to exist in order that they may obtain a recompense but those who are benefited are not concerned about making a recompense epicharmus therefore perhaps would say that these things are asserted by most men in consequence of looking to the depravity of mankind but to act in this manner seems to be conformable to human nature for the multitude are unmindful of the benefits they have received and are more desirous to be benefited than to benefit it would seem however that the cause of this is more natural and does not resemble that which pertains to the loan of money for creditors do not love their debtors but wish them to be preserved for the sake of receiving what they have lent but benefactors love and are fond of those they have benefited though at present they derive no advantage from them 
nor are likely to derive any in future and this also happens to be the case with artificers for every artist loves his own work more than he would be beloved by it if it should become animated perhaps however this particularly happens to be the case with poets for they love their own poems beyond measure and have an affection for them as if they were children similarly therefore to this is that which pertains to benefactors for he who is benefited is their work hence this person is more dear to them than a work is to him by whom it is produced the cause however of this is that existence is to all beings eligible and lovely but we exist in energy for we exist by living and acting he therefore who produces a work is in a certain respect in energy in the work hence he loves the work with a parental affection because existence also is dear to him but this is natural for what the agent is in capacity is indicated by the work in energy at the same time also to the benefactor that which results from the action is beautiful so that he is delighted with him in whom it is inherent but to him who is benefited nothing is beautiful in the benefactor but if anything is it is utility then this is in a less degree delightful and lovely the energy however of present good is delectable as is likewise the hope of future and the memory of past good but the good is most delectable which subsists in energy and in a similar manner that which is lovely to him who benefits therefore the work remains for a beautiful deed is lasting but to him who is benefited the advantage passes away the memory likewise of beautiful deeds is delectable but the memory of useful actions is not very delightful or is so in a less degree it appears however that the contrary takes place with respect to expectation and dilection indeed resembles production but to be beloved is similar to the being passive to love therefore and such things as pertain to friendship are consequent to those who excel in action again all men love in a greater degree things which are laboriously obtained thus for instance men love the wealth which they have themselves procured more than that which they have received from others it appears therefore that to be benefited is a thing unattended with labour but that to benefit is laborious on this account also mothers love their children in a greater degree than fathers for the part which they sustain in the generation of them is more laborious than that which fathers sustain and they in a greater degree know that they are their own offspring but it would seem that this reasoning also is adapted to benefactors chapter eight it may however be doubted whether a man ought to love himself more than some other person for those are reprehended who love themselves transcendently and they are called as a thing disgraceful lovers of themselves and a bad man indeed appears to do everything for the sake of himself and in a greater degree the more he is depraved hence he is accused as doing nothing without a view to his own advantage but the worthy man does everything on account of the beautiful in conduct and he acts in a greater degree in this manner and for the sake of his friend the more worthy he is but he neglects to act for his own sake the deeds however of men are discordant with these assertions not unreasonably for they say that he who is eminently a friend ought to love his friend in an eminent degree but he is eminently a friend who wishes well to him who is the subject of this wish for his sake though no one should know it these things however are especially inherent in a man towards himself and therefore everything else by which a friend is defined for we have before observed that all friendly offices proceed from himself and pervade to others and all proverbs accord with this such as that friends are one soul that among friends all things are common that friendship is equality and that the knee is near to the leg for all these things are especially present with a man towards himself since a man is especially a friend to himself and therefore he is especially to be beloved by himself it may however be reasonably doubted which of these arguments it is requisite to follow 
since both of them are accompanied with probability. Perhaps, therefore, it is necessary to divide such like arguments, and to distinguish how far, and in what respect each of them is true. If, therefore, we understand in what manner each of these denominates a man a lover of himself, perhaps the thing will become manifest. Those, therefore, who consider this as a disgraceful thing, call those men lovers of themselves, who distribute to themselves the greater part, in wealth and honours, and corporeal pleasures. For the multitude aspire after these things, and are earnestly employed in endeavouring to acquire them, as being the best of things, and on this account they become objects of contention. Hence, those who vindicate to themselves more of these things than is fit are subservient to desires, and in short to passions, and the irrational part of the soul. But the multitude are persons of this description. Hence also the appellation was derived from the multitude who are depraved. Justly, therefore, are those reprehended who are in this way lovers of themselves. That the multitude, however, are accustomed to denominate those who distribute to themselves things of this kind, lovers of themselves, is not immanifest. For he who always earnestly endeavors to act justly, or temperately, or to act according to any other of the virtues, the most of all things, and in short, who always vindicates to himself that which is beautiful in conduct, such a man will never be called by any one a lover of himself, nor will he be blamed by any one. It would seem, however, that such a man as this is in a greater degree a lover of himself, for he distributes to himself things which are most eminently beautiful and good, is gratified in his most principal part, intellect, and in all things is obedient to it. But as that which is the most principal thing in a city appears to be most eminently the city, and this is the case in every other system of things, thus also that which is most principal in man is especially the man. He therefore who loves this principal part of himself is especially a lover of himself, and is gratified with this. Hence also one man is denominated continent, and another incontinent, because in the former intellect has dominion, but has not in the latter, in consequence of every man being this, i.e. intellect. Men likewise appear to have performed things, and to have performed them willingly, which they have especially performed in conjunction with reason. That every man, therefore, is principally intellect, and that the worthy man principally loves this, is not immanifest. Hence he will be especially a lover of himself, according to a different species of self-love from that which is disgraceful, and differing as much from it as to live according to reason differs from living according to passion, and as much as the desire of that which is beautiful in conduct differs from the desire of that which appears to be advantageous. All men, therefore, approve of and applaud those who, in a manner superior to others, endeavour to perform beautiful actions. But if that which is really beautiful in conduct was that for which all men contend, and if they endeavoured to perform the most beautiful deeds, whatever is becoming would be possessed by all men in common, and the greatest of goods by every one particularly, since virtue is a thing of this kind. Hence it is necessary that a good man should be a lover of himself, for he himself is benefited by acting well, and he also benefits others. But it is not proper that a depraved man should be a lover of himself, for he will hurt both himself and his neighbours, in consequence of being subservient to base passions. With the depraved man, therefore, there is a dissonance between what he ought to do and what he does. But with the worthy man, those things which he ought to do, he also does. For every intellect chooses that which is best for itself, and the worthy man is obedient to intellect. That, however, which is asserted of the worthy man is true, that for the sake of his friends and his country he will do many things, even though it should be requisite to die for them. For he will give up riches and honours, and in short those goods which are the objects of contention with mankind in order that he may vindicate to himself that which is beautiful in conduct. For he will rather choose to be very much delighted for a short time, than to experience a small delight for a long time, 
and to live worthily for one year than casually for many years he will also prefer one beautiful and great action to many and small actions and this perhaps happened to be the case with those who have died for their country or their friends worthy men therefore choose a great good for themselves and will give up their riches in order that they may obtain a greater number of friends for thus indeed riches befall the friend of the worthy man but that which is really beautiful befalls the worthy man himself but he distributes to himself the greater good there is also the same mode of conduct with him as to honours and dominion for he will give up all these to his friend for this to him is beautiful and laudable reasonably therefore does he appear to be a worthy man who chooses that which is beautiful in conduct instead of these things it may likewise happen that he may give up actions to his friends and that it may be better for him to be the cause of their being performed by his friends than to do them himself hence in all laudable things the worthy man appears to distribute to himself more of that which is truly beautiful after this manner therefore as we have said it is necessary that a man should be a lover of himself but it is not proper he should be so in the way in which the multitude love themselves chapter nine with respect to the happy man also it is doubted whether he will be in want of friends or not for it is said that those who are blessed and sufficient to themselves have no need of friends because things truly good are present with them as they are therefore say they sufficient to themselves they are not in want of anything but a friend being a man's other self imparts to him those things which he cannot obtain through himself whence also it is said quote, when divinity is propitious what need is there of friends Close quote. it seems however to be absurd that those who attribute every good to the happy man should not give him friends which appear to be the greatest of external goods but if it is the province of a friend rather to benefit than to be benefited and if it is also the province of a good man and of virtue to benefit and it is better to do good to friends than to strangers the worthy man will want those who may be benefited by him hence likewise it is inquired whether there is more need of friends in adversity than in prosperity because he who is unfortunate is in want of those by whom he may be benefited and the fortunate are in want of those whom they may benefit perhaps however it is also absurd to make the blessed man a solitary being for no one would choose to possess every good by himself since man is a social animal and is naturally adapted to live with others this therefore will also be the case with the happy man for he possesses those things which are naturally good but it is evident that it is better to pass the time with friends and worthy men than with strangers and casual persons hence the happy man has need of friends in what respect therefore is the first assertion true that the happy man is not in want of friends is it because the multitude think those persons to be friends who are useful to them the blessed man therefore will not be in any want of such persons since real good is present with him neither therefore will he be in want of those who are friends on account of the delectable or he will want them but for a short time for since his life is delightful he will be in no want of adventitious pleasure but not being in want of friends of this description he does not appear to be in want of friends this however perhaps is not true for it was observed by us in the beginning that felicity is a certain energy but with respect to energy it is evident that it is in generation or is passing into existence and is not present with him who energizes like a certain possession but if to be happy consists in living and energizing and the energy of the good man is of itself worthy and delectable as we observed in the beginning if also that which is appropriate ranks among the number of things that are delightful but we are more able to survey our neighbours than ourselves and their actions than our own and if the actions of worthy men that are friends are delightful to good men bracket, for both have those things which are naturally delectable close bracket. if this be the case the blessed man will be in want of such friends as these since he deliberately chooses to survey worthy and appropriate actions but the actions of a good man 
who is a friend are of this description it is likewise thought to be necessary that the happy man should live delectably the life therefore of a solitary man is indeed difficult for it is not easy for a man to energize continually by himself but with others and towards others it is easy the energy therefore will be more continued which is delectable by itself which should necessarily be present with the blessed man for the worthy man so far as he is worthy rejoices in the actions which are conformable to virtue but is indignant with those which proceed from vice just as a musician is delighted with beautiful melodies but is pained with those that are bad a certain exercise of virtue likewise will be produced from living with good men as also theognis says to those however who consider this affair more physically it appears that a worthy friend is naturally eligible to a worthy man for it has been said by us that what is naturally good is of itself to a worthy man good and delectable to live however is in animals defined by the power of sense but in men by the power of sense or intellection but power is referred to energy and that which has the principal authority in a thing consists in energy it seems therefore that to live is properly either to perceive sensibly or intellectually and to live is among the number of things which are good and delectable for it is a definite thing but that which is definite pertains to the nature of the good as it also appeared to the pythagoreans and that which is naturally good is also good to the worthy man hence to live appears to all men to be delightful a depraved and corrupted life however ought not to be assumed nor a life of pain for such a life is indefinite as well as the things which belong to it this however will be more evident in what we shall say concerning pain hereafter but if to live is itself good it is also delectable and it appears that it is so from this that all men aspire after it and especially worthy and blessed men for to these life is most eligible and the life of these is most blessed he however who sees perceives that he sees he who hears perceives that he hears and he who walks perceives that he walks and in a similar manner in other things there is something which perceives that we energize but we may perceive that we perceive and we may understand that we understand for us however to perceive that we perceive or to understand that we understand is for us to be for we have said that our very being consists in perceiving sensibly or intellectually but for a man to perceive that he lives is among the number of things essentially delectable for life is naturally good and for a man to perceive that good is present with him is delightful but to live is eligible and especially to good men because existence to them is good and delectable for having a co-sensation of essential good they are delighted as however the worthy man is disposed towards himself thus also he is disposed towards his friends for a friend is another self as therefore it is eligible to every one for himself to exist thus also or similarly it is eligible to him for his friend to exist but we have said that existence is eligible because it is for a man to perceive himself which is good and a sensation of this kind is of itself delightful it is necessary therefore that he should at the same time perceive that his friend exists but this will be effected by living together with him and in a communication with him of words and thoughts for it would seem that in this way men are said to live together and not as cattle by feeding in the same place if therefore existence is of itself eligible to the blessed man since it is naturally good and delectable the like also must be asserted of a friend and hence a friend will be among the number of eligible things to the happy man but that which is eligible to him ought to be present with him for in this respect he will be indigent the man therefore who is to be happy will require worthy friends chapter ten are numerous friends therefore to be procured or as it appears to be elegantly said of hospitality quote, want not nor be of multitudes a guest 
Close quote. May it also in friendship be appropriately said that a man should neither be without a friend, nor again should have an excessive multitude of friends? This assertion, therefore, will indeed appear to be very much adapted to those who regard utility in friendship. For to be alternately subservient to many persons is laborious, and life is not sufficient to them to perform this. Hence, more friends than are sufficient for the proper purposes of life are superfluous, and are impediments to a worthy life. Hence there is no need of them. And with respect to the friends that are procured for the sake of pleasure, a very few are sufficient. In the same manner as sauce to food. But whether or not ought a good man to have many worthy friends? Or shall we say that there is a certain measure of a multitude of friends, in the same manner as there is of a city? For a city will not consist of ten men, nor is it any longer a city if it is composed of a hundred thousand men. Perhaps, however, one certain number of citizens cannot be assigned, but every number may be admitted, which is between certain definite terms. Of friends, therefore, there is also a certain definite multitude, and perhaps those persons are not numerous with whom it is possible for a man to live, for this appears to be a thing of a most friendly nature. But that it is not possible for a man to live with many, and distribute himself among them, is not immanifest. Farther still, it is necessary, if the friends are numerous, that they should be friends to each other, if all of them intend to pass the time with each other. But this among many friends is laborious. It is likewise difficult to rejoice and grieve appropriately together with many persons. For it is probable that it may at one and the same time happen, that a man ought to rejoice together with one person, and grieve together with another. Perhaps, therefore, it is well not to endeavour to have a great number of friends, but as many as are sufficient for the purposes of social life. For it would seem that it is not possible to be very much a friend to many persons. Hence, neither is it possible to love many, for love is a certain excess of friendship. But this is confined to one person, and therefore vehement love must be confined to a few. That this, indeed, is the case, seems to be verified by themselves. For there are not many friends according to that friendship which subsists among associates. But the friendships which are celebrated are said to have subsisted between two persons. Those, however, who are the friends of many persons, and are familiarly conversant with all of them, appear to be the friends of no one, except politically, and these persons are also called obsequious. It is possible, therefore, to be politically a friend to many persons, though he who is so should happen not to be obsequious, but a truly worthy man. But it is not possible to be a friend to many, on account of virtue, and for their own sake. But we must be satisfied, if we can find a few such, i.e., who are true friends. Chapter 11 But whether is there more need of friends in prosperity or in adversity? for in both they are sought after. For those who are in adversity require assistance, and those who are in prosperity are in want of associates, and those whom they may benefit, since they wish to confer favours on others. In adversity, therefore, friends are more necessary, on which account, when this is the case, there is need of useful friends. In prosperity, however, friends are a more worthy and beautiful possession, on which account, also, Men whose circumstances are prosperous search for worthy friends, for it is more eligible to benefit these, and with these to pass through life. For the presence itself of friends is delightful, both in prosperity and adversity, since the grief of those who are in affliction is lightened when their friends participate of their sorrow. Hence, likewise, it may be doubted whether friends share a part of the affliction of their friends, as if it were part of a burden. Or is this not the case, but the presence of friends being delightful, the conception that they participate of the sorrow produces a diminution of the grief? Whether, therefore, those who are in affliction are alleviated through these causes, or through some other cause, we shall omit to investigate. What we have mentioned, however, appears to happen, but the presence of friends appears to be something mixed. For the sight itself of friends is delectable, and especially to those in adverse circumstances, and it becomes a certain auxiliary against affliction, for a friend possesses a consoling power, 
both in his presence and his words, if he is dexterous, since he knows the manners of his friend, and with what he is pleased and pained. It is painful, however, to perceive that our friend is afflicted by our misfortunes, for every one avoids being the cause of pain to his friends. Hence those who are of a virile nature are careful to prevent their friends from being afflicted in conjunction with themselves, unless they perceive that, by subjecting their friends to a little pain, they shall themselves experience an alleviation of great affliction. And, in short, they do not permit others to lament with them, because they are not themselves addicted to lamentation. But women, who are weaker than the rest of their sex, and men, who resemble them, are delighted with those who groan with them, and love them as their friends, and the associates of their sorrow. In all things, however, it is necessary to imitate the better character. But the presence of friends in prosperity is attended with a pleasing association, and with the conception that they are delighted with our good fortune. Hence it would seem to be necessary that in prosperity we should readily and cheerfully invite our friends to partake of our good fortune, for it is beautiful to be beneficent, but that we should be remiss in inviting them to partake of our ill fortune, for it is requisite to impart to our friends as little as possible of evils, whence it is said, quote, that I am wretched is sufficient, Close quote. But friends are then especially to be called upon, when, having received small molestations, we can be greatly benefited by their presence. On the contrary, it is perhaps proper to go to those who are in adversity uncalled and cheerfully, for it is the province of a friend to benefit, and especially to benefit those who are in want, and who do not think fit to solicit relief, for this is better and more delectable to both. With fortunate friends, however, we should cheerfully co-operate, for in prosperity also there is need of a friend. But we should slowly betake ourselves to a friend, in order to be benefited by him, for it is not beautiful to be readily and cheerfully disposed to be benefited. It is, perhaps, however, requisite to be cautious that we do not conduct ourselves unpleasantly in rejecting the beneficence of our friends, for this sometimes happens to be eligible in all things. Chapter 12. Whether, therefore, as to lovers, the sight of the beloved object is most delectable, and they prefer this sense to the rest, because love especially subsists, and is produced from this, thus also it is most eligible to friends to live together. For friendship is communion, and, in the same manner, as a man is affected towards himself, he is also affected towards his friend but it is eligible to every one to perceive with respect to himself that he exists and lives and therefore this is also eligible with respect to a friend this energy however is affected among friends by living together so that this is reasonably desired by them and that in which to every one his very being consists or for the sake of which he chooses to live in this he wishes to pass his life with his friends Hence, some friends indeed drink together, others play at dice together, others engage in gymnastic exercises and hunt together, or philosophize together, but they severally pass their time together, in that to which of all things in life they are most attached. For, wishing to live with their friends, they do these things, and communicate with them in these, through which they are of opinion, they associate together. The friendship, therefore, of bad men is depraved, for being unstable they communicate with each other in bad things and they become depraved being assimilated to each other but the friendship of worthy men is worthy and is mutually increased by mutual converse they also appear to become better by energizing with and correcting each other for they mutually express those things with which they are delighted whence it is said quote, from good men what is good is learnt Close quote and thus much concerning friendship. It remains to discuss, in the next place, pleasure. End of Book 9 Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards Book 10 of the Nicomachean Ethics This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Edwards. The Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Book 10. Chapter 1. After these things, perhaps, it follows that we should discuss pleasure. For this appears to be especially familiar and allied to our race. Hence, those who educate youth regulate them by pleasure and pain, as by a rudder. But it appears to be a thing of the greatest consequence with respect to the virtue of manners to rejoice in those things in which it is proper to rejoice, and to hate those things which it is proper to hate. For these things extend through the whole of life, and have a preponderation and power towards virtue, and a happy life, since things which are delectable are indeed the objects of deliberate choice, but those that are painful are avoided. It seems, however, that things of this kind are by no means to be passed over in silence, especially since they possess an abundant ambiguity. For some, indeed, say that good itself is pleasure, but others, on the contrary, assert that pleasure is a very bad thing. The former, indeed, being perhaps persuaded that it is so, but the latter thinking that it will be more beneficial to our life to evince that pleasure ranks among bad things, even though it should not. For the multitude tend to it, and are subservient to pleasures. Hence, say they, it is necessary to lead them to the pursuit of the contrary to pleasure, for thus they may arrive at the medium. Perhaps, however, this is not well said, for words respecting things which pertain to passions and actions are less credible than deeds. When, therefore, they are discordant with the perceptions of sense, being despised, they also subvert the truth. For he who blames pleasure, if he is at any time seen to desire it, seems to incline towards it, as if every pleasure was of this attractive nature. For to distinguish one pleasure from another is not the province of the multitude. True assertions, therefore, appear not only to be most useful with respect to knowledge, but also with respect to life, for they are believed when they accord with deeds. Hence, they exhort those who understand them to live conformably to them. Of things of this kind, therefore, thus much may suffice. Let us now discuss the assertions of others concerning pleasure. Chapter 2 Eudoxus, therefore, thought that pleasure was good itself, because all animals are seen to desire it, both such as are rational and such as are irrational. But in all things the eligible is good, and that which is especially eligible is the best of things. And because all things tend to the same thing, it is an indication that the object to which they tend is to all things that which is most excellent. For everything discovers that which is good to it, in the same manner as it discovers nutriment. Hence, that which is good to all things, and which all things desire, is good itself. These arguments, however, are rendered credible more through the virtuous manners of their author than through themselves, for it appears that he was a remarkably temperate man. It does not seem, therefore, that he made these assertions as the friend of pleasure, but because he believed them to be true. It likewise appeared to him to be no less evident that pleasure is good itself. From the contrary, for pain is of itself avoided by all animals, and in a similar manner the contrary to pain is eligible to all animals. But that is especially eligible, which we choose not on account of something else, nor for the sake of another thing. It is, however, acknowledged that pleasure is a thing of this kind, for no one asks another person what the final cause is why he is delighted, as if pleasure were a thing eligible of itself, and which renders the good to which it is added more eligible, such, for instance, as to act justly and temperately. The good, therefore, is itself increased by itself. This argument, therefore, evinces that pleasure ranks among the number of goods, and that it is not more good than another good. For every good in conjunction with another good is more eligible than when it is alone. Plato also subverts an argument of this kind, that pleasure is not good itself. For he says that a delectable life, in conjunction with wisdom, is more eligible than without it. 
but if the mixed life is better than a life of pleasure alone pleasure will not be good itself for good itself will not become more eligible by anything being added to it it is evident however that neither will anything else be good itself which in conjunction with something which is of itself good becomes more eligible what therefore is the thing of this kind of which we also participate for a thing of this kind is the object of investigation those however who deny that it is good which all beings desire say nothing to the purpose for we say that the thing which appears to all beings to exist does exist but he who subverts this belief does not assert that which is very much more credible for if they denied that to be good which is desired by beings destitute of intellect there would be some truth in what they say but if they also deny that to be good which beings endued with prudence and wisdom desire how will they say anything which can be admitted perhaps also even in bad men there is a certain natural good which transcends their depravity and which aspires after its proper good neither does that which is asserted of the contrary to pleasure appear to be well said for it does not follow say they that if pain is an evil pleasure is good since evil is opposed to evil and both good and evil are opposed to that which is neither and these things indeed are asserted by them not badly yet they are not true when applied to the present subject for if both pleasure and pain were bad it would be requisite that both should be avoided but if neither is bad neither is to be avoided or each is similarly to be avoided but now indeed it appears that pain is avoided as an evil and that pleasure is chosen as a good in this manner therefore they are opposed to each other chapter three neither does it follow that if pleasure is not among the number of qualities it is not on this account good for neither are the energies of virtue qualities nor is felicity a quality they say therefore that good is definite but that pleasure is indefinite because it receives the more and the less hence if they form this judgment from the being delighted the same thing will also take place in justice and the other virtues in which men evidently assert that there is more and less of things of this kind for some are more just and brave than others it is likewise possible to act justly and to live temperately in a greater and less degree but if they admit this to take place in pleasures they do not seem to have assigned the cause of it if some pleasures indeed are unmingled but others are mingled what however hinders but that in the same manner as health which is a definite thing receives the more and the less this also may be the case with pleasure for there is not the same symmetry in all things nor is there always one certain symmetry in the same thing but suffering a remission it remains for a certain time and differs in the more and the less a thing of this kind therefore may also happen to pleasure as they likewise admit that good itself is perfect but that motions and generations are imperfect they endeavour to show that pleasure is motion and generation they do not however appear to assert this well since pleasure is not motion for to all motion swiftness and slowness appear to be appropriate and though not per se such as to the motion of the world yet they are appropriate with reference to another motion but neither of these is inherent in pleasure for it is possible indeed to be rapidly delighted in the same manner as it is possible to be swiftly enraged but it is not possible for the delight itself to be swift or slow not even with reference to something else it is possible however that walking and argumentation may be swift or slow and everything else of the like kind hence it is possible to be changed quickly and slowly into pleasure but it is not possible to energize swiftly according to it viz to be delighted swiftly according to it and in what manner will pleasure be generation for it appears that not any casual thing is generated from any casual thing but that a thing is dissolved into that from which it was generated and that of which pleasure is the generation of this pain is the corruption they also say that pain is the indigence of that which is according to nature but that pleasure is the complete fulness of it 
but these are corporeal passions if therefore pleasure is the complete fulness of that which subsists according to nature that in which this fulness takes place will also be delighted hence the body will be delighted but it does not appear that this is the case pleasure therefore is not complete fulness but complete fulness indeed taking place some one may be delighted and when cut he may be pained this opinion however appears to have originated from the pleasures and pains pertaining to food for when we are in want of nutriment and have been previously pained in consequence of this want we are delighted with being completely filled this however does not happen to be the case in all pleasures for mathematical pleasures are unattended with pain and also those sensible pleasures which subsist through the smell and hearing and the sight many recollections also and hopes are unattended with pain of what therefore will these be the generations for in these there have been no previous indigence of anything of which these may be the complete fulness but to those who adduce disgraceful pleasures in confirmation of this opinion it may be said that these are not simply delectable for it must not be admitted that if these are delightful to those who are badly disposed they are also simply delectable but that they are so to these only as neither are those things simply salubrious or sweet or bitter which appear to be so to those who are diseased nor again are those things white which appear to be so to those whose eyes are dimmed with rheum it may likewise be said in reply that pleasures are indeed eligible yet not from these things just as to be rich is eligible yet not by treachery and to be well is eligible yet not by eating any kind of food or it may be said that pleasures are specifically different for those pleasures which are produced by worthy are different from those which are produced by base pursuits and it is not possible for any one to be delighted with the pleasure of a just man who is not just or with the pleasure of a musician who is not a lover of music and in a similar manner in other things a friend also who is a different person from a flatterer appears to evince that pleasure is not good or that pleasures are specifically different for it seems that the association of a friend is with a view to good but of a flatterer with a view to pleasure and the one is reprobated but the other is praised in consequence of their associations being directed to different ends besides no one would choose to live possessing a puerile understanding through the whole of life and being delighted as much as possible with those things which are the objects of puerile delight nor would any one choose so to rejoice in doing something most base as never to be grieved for having done it we likewise earnestly apply ourselves to many things though they should procure us no pleasure such as to see to recollect to know and to possess the virtues but it makes no difference if pleasure follows these things from necessity for we should choose these though no pleasure should be produced from them that pleasure therefore is not good itself and that all pleasure is not eligible appears to be evident as likewise that some pleasures are eligible of themselves but differ in species or in the things from which they are produced and thus much may suffice with respect to what is asserted by others concerning pleasure and pain chapter four what pleasure however is or what kind of thing it is will become more evident by resuming the consideration of it from the beginning for the sight indeed seems to be perfect at any time since it is not indigent of anything which taking place afterwards will give perfection to its form but pleasure seems to resemble a thing of this kind for it is a certain whole nor can a pleasure be assumed at any time the form of which would be perfected by the accession of a longer time hence neither is it motion for all motion is in time and is referred to a certain end thus for instance the motion which exists in building a temple is perfect when it affects that which it desires to accomplish it is perfect therefore either in the whole of the time or in this time but in the parts of the time all the motions are imperfect and are specifically different from the whole motion and from each other for the composition of the stones is different from the erection of the pillar at right angles 
and these motions are different from the fabrication of the temple. And the motion, indeed, employed in building the temple is perfect, for it is in want of nothing to the proposed end, but the motion employed in laying the foundation and the roof is imperfect, for each pertains to a part. The motions, therefore, are specifically different, and it is not possible to assume a motion perfect in its species in any time, except the whole time like also takes place in walking and other motions. For if lation is a motion from one place to another, the specific differences of this motion are flying, walking, leaping, and the like. And not only so, but in walking itself there is a difference. For the motion from one place to another in walking is not the same in the stadium, and a part of the stadium, and in the different parts of it nor is the mutation of place the same in passing through this line and that, viz. in passing through a curve and a straight line. For not only a line is passed through, but a line existing in place, and this line is in a different place from that. We have, therefore, accurately discussed motion elsewhere, i.e. in the fifth book of the physics. Hence it appears that motion is not perfect in every time, but that the multitude of motions are imperfect, and specifically different, since they are formalized by proceeding from one place to another. The form, however, of pleasure is perfect in any time. It is evident, therefore, that motion and pleasure are different from each other, and that pleasure is something whole and perfect. This would also seem to be evident from the impossibility of being moved except in time. But the possibility of being delighted without time i.e. in an instant, for that which is effected in the now, or an instant, is a certain whole. From these things, however, it is manifest that it is not well said that pleasure is motion or generation. For motion and generation are not predicated of all things, but of those only which may be distributed into parts, and are not wholes. For there is not generation of sight, nor of a point, nor of the monad, nor is there either motion or generation of these. Neither, therefore, is there of pleasure, for it is a certain whole. Hence, from what has been said, it is evident that a certain pleasure is conjoined with every sense in energy, which energizes without being impeded. But the energy of the sense is perfect, which is well disposed towards the most beautiful of the objects that fall under the sense. For perfect energy appears to be especially a thing of this kind. It is, however, of no consequence whether it is said that the sense itself energizes, or that in which it exists. But in everything, the energy is the most excellent of that which is disposed in the best manner towards the most excellent of the things which are subject to it. But this energy will be most perfect and most delightful. For there is pleasure according to every sense, and in a similar manner according to every discursive energy of the soul, and every contemplation. But the most perfect energy is the most delectable, and that is the most perfect, which is the energy of that which is well disposed towards the best of the things subject to it. Pleasure, however, perfects energy. But pleasure does not perfect energy after the same manner as the object of sense perfects sense, when both are in good condition, just as neither are health and a physician similarly the cause of being made well. It is evident, however, that pleasure is produced according to each of the senses, for we say that things which are seen, and things which are heard, are delectable, and it is also evident that they are especially delectable, when the sense is most excellent, and energizes about the most excellent object. But where the sensible object, and that which perceives it, are things of this kind, there will always be pleasure, the agent and patient being present. Pleasure, however, perfects energy, not as an inherent habit, but as a certain supervening end, such as the flower of age in those who are in their acme. As long, however, as that which is sensible or intelligible is such as it ought to be, and also that which judges or contemplates, pleasure will be in energy. For when that which is passive and that which is active are similar, and subsisting after the same manner with reference to each other, the same thing is naturally adapted to be produced. 
how therefore does it happen that no one is continually delighted is it because he becomes at length weary for all human concerns are incapable of energizing continually neither therefore can pleasure be generated in an uninterrupted continuity for it is consequent to energy some things however delight when they are new but afterwards for this reason because pleasure cannot be generated incessantly do not similarly delight for at first indeed the discursive power of the soul inclines towards and intently energizes about these in the same manner as those who look intently at anything afterwards however an energy of this kind is no longer produced but it becomes remiss hence the pleasure also is obscured it may however be thought that all men aspire after pleasure because all of them desire to live but life is a certain energy and every one energizes about and in those things which he especially loves thus for instance the musician energizes with the hearing about the melodies but the lover of disciplines energizes with the discursive power of his soul about theorems and in a similar manner the lover of other pursuits but pleasure perfects energies and it likewise perfects life which is the object of desire reasonably therefore do all men aspire after pleasure for it gives perfection to the life of each which is an eligible thing we shall however omit for the present to consider whether we choose to live on account of pleasure or choose pleasure for the sake of living for these things appear to be conjoined and do not admit of being separated for pleasure is not produced without energy and pleasure gives perfection to every energy chapter five hence also pleasures appear to be specifically different for we are of opinion that things specifically different are perfected through perfections specifically different for this appears to be the case both with natural and artificial productions as for instance with animals and trees pictures and statues houses and furniture in a similar manner therefore we are of opinion that energies specifically different are perfected by things that differ in species but the energies of the discursive powers of reason differ from the energies of the senses and these are specifically different from each other hence also the pleasures which give perfection to these are specifically different this however will also become apparent from hence that each of the pleasures is intimately familiarized with the energy which it perfects for appropriate pleasures co-increase energy since those who energize in conjunction with pleasure energize about everything more accurately and with more exquisite judgment thus for instance those become more excellent geometricians who are delighted to geometrize and they understand in a greater degree everything geometrical the like also takes place with the lovers of music the lovers of architecture and the lovers of the other arts for each of these makes a proficiency in his proper employment if he delights in it pleasures therefore co-increase energies but things which co-increase are appropriate and to things which are specifically different the things also which are appropriate are specifically different again this will in a greater degree become apparent from considering that pleasures which are produced from different things are an impediment to energies for the lovers of the flute cannot attend to discourse if they hear any one playing on the flute in consequence of being more delighted with the melody of the flute than with the present energy i e than with what is said the pleasure therefore which is produced by the melody of the flute corrupts the energy of discourse and in a similar manner this also happens in other things when a man energizes at one and the same time about two things for the more delectable energy expels the other and this in a still greater degree if it very much surpasses in pleasure so as to render it impossible to energize according to the other energy hence when we are very much delighted with anything we do not in any great degree perform anything else but when we are only moderately pleased with certain things we can do others thus those who in the theatres eat sweetmeats are especially accustomed to do this when the performers act badly since however appropriate pleasure gives accuracy to energies 
and renders them more lasting and better, but foreign pleasures corrupt them, it is evident that these pleasures differ very much from each other. For nearly foreign pleasures affect the same thing as appropriate pains, i.e., as the pains which are consequent to certain energies. Thus, if it is unpleasant and painful to any one to write, or to any one to reason, the former indeed will not write, and the latter will not reason, in consequence of the energy being painful. From appropriate pleasures and pains, therefore, that which is contrary happens about energies. But those pleasures and pains are appropriate, which are essentially consequent to energy. And, with respect to foreign pleasures, we have already observed that they affect something similar to pain, for they corrupt, though not in a similar manner. Since, however, energies differ in probity and depravity, and some of them indeed being eligible, but others to be avoided, and others being neither, pleasures also have a similar mode of subsistence. For there is an appropriate pleasure in every energy. The pleasure, therefore, which is appropriate to a worthy energy is worthy, but that which is appropriate to a bad energy is depraved. For the desires, indeed, of things truly beautiful are laudable, but of base things are blamable. The pleasures, however, which are in energies are more appropriate to the energies than desires are. For desires, indeed, are separated from energies by time and by nature. But pleasures are proximate to energies, and are so indistinct from them as to render it dubious whether energy is the same with pleasure. It does not appear, however, that pleasure is either the discursive energy of reason or sense, for it would be absurd to suppose that it is. Though on account of the inseparability of pleasure from energy, it seems to certain persons to be the same with it. As, therefore, energies are different, so likewise pleasures. But the sight differs from the touch in purity, and the hearing and the smell from the taste. Hence the pleasures also of these senses similarly differ, and those which pertain to the discursive energy of reason likewise differ, and both these differ from each other. It seems, however, that there is an appropriate pleasure to every animal, just as there also is an appropriate work. For this pleasure is that which subsists according to energy, and this will be apparent from a survey of each particular. For there is one pleasure of a horse, another of a dog, and another of a man. And, as Heraclitus says, an ass would prefer straw to gold, because food is more delectable to asses than gold. The pleasures, therefore, of animals specifically different are likewise specifically different. But it is reasonable to suppose that the pleasures of the same animals are without a specific difference. There is no small variety, however, in pleasures among men. For the same things are painful to some, and pleasing to others. And to some, indeed, they are painful and odious, but to others delectable and lovely. This, likewise, happens to be the case in sweet things. For the same things do not appear sweet to a man in a fever, and to one who is well. Nor does the same thing appear to be hot to him who is weak, and to him who is of a good habit of body. And in a similar manner this happens to be the case in other things. In all such things as these, however, that is simply delectable, which appears to be so to the worthy man. But if this is well said, as it appears that it is, and virtue is the measure of everything, and a good man so far as he is good, those things will be pleasures which appear to be so to the good man, and those things will be delectable in which he rejoices. It is, however, by no means wonderful if things which appear to him to be of a troublesome nature should to another person of a different character appear to be delectable. For many corruptions and noxious circumstances happen to men, but these are not simply delectable, except to these persons and to those who are thus disposed. With respect, therefore, to those pleasures which are acknowledged to be base, it is evident that they are not to be called pleasures, except by corrupt men. But, with respect to those pleasures which appear to be worthy, what is the quality of the pleasure, or what shall we say the pleasure is, which is proper to men? Or shall we say that this is evident from energies? For pleasures are consequent to these. Whether, therefore, there is one energy, or whether there are many energies of the perfect and blessed man, the pleasures which give perfection to these may be properly called the pleasures of man. But the remaining pleasures, in the same manner as the energies, may be denominated the pleasures of man, secondarily and multifariously. 
Chapter 6 Having therefore spoken concerning the virtues, and friendships, and pleasures, it remains that we should delineate felicity, since we admit that it is the end of human concerns. Hence, by recapitulating what we have before said, the discussion will be more concise. We have said, then, that felicity is not a habit, for, if it were, it might be present with him who passes the whole of his life in sleep, living the life of a plant, and also with him who is involved in the greatest calamities. If, therefore, these things cannot be admitted, but felicity must rather be referred to a certain energy, as we have before observed, but of energies some are necessary and eligible on account of other things, and others are eligible of themselves. If this be the case, it is evident that felicity must be admitted to be some one of the energies which are of themselves eligible, and not one of those which are eligible on account of something else. For felicity is not indigent of anything, but is sufficient to itself. But those energies are eligible of themselves, from which nothing except the energy is the object of investigation. But the actions which are conformable to virtue appear to be things of this kind. For to perform beautiful and worthy deeds is among the number of things which are of themselves eligible, and among diversions. This is also the case with those that are delectable, since they are not chosen on account of other things. For those who are addicted to them are rather injured than benefited in consequence of neglecting their bodies and possessions. Many of those, however, who are said to be happy men, fly to diversions, on which account those who are versatile in such like methods of spending their time are esteemed by tyrants, for they render themselves pleasing in those things which they desire, and they are in want of persons of this description. These things, therefore, appear to pertain to felicity, because men in authority and power are at leisure for these. Perhaps, however, persons of this description are no indication that these things pertain to felicity. For neither virtue nor intellect, from which worthy energies proceed, consist in dominion and power. Nor, if these men, not having tasted of genuine and liberal pleasure, fly to corporeal pleasures, must it be supposed that on this account these pleasures are more eligible. For children also fancy that things which are honoured by them are the best of things. It is reasonable, therefore, to admit that as different things appear to be honourable to children and men, so likewise to bad and worthy men. Hence, as we have frequently said, those things are honourable and delectable which are so to the worthy man. But the energy to every one is most eligible, which is according to an appropriate habit, and to the worthy man the energy is most eligible, which is according to virtue. Felicity, therefore, does not consist in diversions, for it is absurd to admit that diversion is the end, i.e. the chief good of man, and that the whole of life is to be busily employed, and molestations endured for the sake of indulging in sports, since, as I may say, we choose all things for the sake of something else, except felicity, for this is the end. But to act seriously, and to labour for the sake of diversion, appears to be foolish and very puerile. He, however, who engages in sports, in order that he may act seriously, which Anacharsis thought was proper, appears to be right. For diversion resembles repose. But as men are incapable of labouring incessantly, they require relaxation. Relaxation, however, is not an end, for it subsists for the sake of energy. But a happy life appears to be conformable to virtue, and this is a worthy life, and does not consist in amusements. We likewise say that serious pursuits are better than those that are ridiculous, and accompanied with jesting and sport, and that the energy of the better part, and the better man, is always more worthy. But the energy of that which is better is more excellent, and more adapted to felicity. Any casual person, also, and a slave, may enjoy corporeal pleasures, no less than the best of men. No one, however, would ascribe felicity to a slave, unless they also ascribe to him a worthy life. For felicity does not consist in sports, in corporeal pleasures, but in the energies according to virtue, as we have before observed. Chapter 7 If, however, felicity is an energy according to virtue, it is reasonable to suppose that it is an energy according to the most excellent virtue, and this will be the virtue of the most excellent part or power. 
whether therefore this be the intellect or something else which appears to rule and be the leader by nature and to have a conception of things beautiful and divine or whether it is itself divine or the most divine of all our parts the energy of this according to its proper virtue will be perfect felicity but we have said that this energy is contemplative and this appears to accord with what we before asserted and also with truth for this energy is the most excellent since intellect is the best of all our parts and of objects of knowledge those are the most excellent about which intellect is conversant this energy also is most continued for we are able to contemplate more incessantly than to perform any action whatever we likewise think that pleasure ought to be mingled with felicity but the energy according to wisdom is acknowledged to be the most delectable of all the energies according to virtue wisdom therefore appears to possess pleasures admirable both for their purity and stability it is reasonable also to think that those who possess knowledge live more pleasantly than those who investigate that too which is called self-sufficiency will especially subsist about the contemplative energy for of the necessaries of life the wise and the just man and the rest of those who possess the moral virtues are in want but even when they are sufficiently supplied with these the just man is in want of those towards whom and together with whom he may act justly and in like manner the temperate and the brave man and each of the rest but the wise man when alone is able to contemplate and by how much the wiser he is by so much the more does he possess this ability perhaps indeed he will contemplate better when he has others to cooperate with him but at the same time he is most sufficient to himself this energy alone likewise will appear to be beloved for its own sake for nothing else is produced from it besides contemplation but from things of a practical nature we obtain something more or less besides the action itself felicity also appears to consist in leisure for we engage in business that we may be at leisure and we wage more that we may live in peace the energies therefore of the political virtues consist either in political or in military transactions but the actions which are conversant with these appear to be full of employment this indeed is perfectly the case with military transactions for no one chooses to wage war or prepare for it for the sake of waging war since he would appear to be perfectly a homicide who should make enemies of his friends for the sake of fighting and slaughter the energy too of the politician is of a busy nature and besides the management of public affairs is employed in procuring dominion and honour or a felicity for himself and the citizens different from the political energy which also as something different we evidently investigate if therefore political and military actions surpass in beauty and magnitude all other virtuous actions but these are of a busy nature aspire after a certain end and are not eligible for their own sakes but the energy of intellect which is contemplative appears to excel other energies in ardour and to desire no other and besides itself if also it possesses a proper pleasure which increases its energy and has in addition to this self-sufficiency leisure and unwearied power so far as the condition of human nature will permit with whatever else is attributed to the blessed and appears to subsist according to this energy if such be the case this will be the perfect felicity of man when it receives a perfect length of life for nothing belonging to felicity is imperfect such a life however will be more excellent than that which is merely human for man will not thus live so far as he is man but so far as he contains in himself something divine and as much as this part excels the composite so much does its energy surpass the energy belonging to every other virtue if therefore intellect is divine with respect to man the life also according to intellect will be divine with respect to human life nor ought we according to the exhortation of certain persons to be wise in human affairs since we are men nor to regard mortal concerns since we are mortal but as much as possible we should immortalize ourselves and do everything in order to live according to our most excellent part for this part though it is small in bulk 
par excels all things in power and dignity it would seem also that each of us is this part since that which obtains dominion is also more excellent it would therefore be absurd for a man not to choose his own life but the life of something else that too which was before asserted accords with what is now said for that which is intimately allied to any nature is most excellent and pleasant to that nature and hence a life according to intellect will be most excellent and pleasant to man since this part is most eminently man this life therefore is also most happy chapter eight but that felicity ranks in the second place which subsists according to another virtue for the energies according to this virtue are human for we act justly and bravely and perform other things conformable to the virtues towards each other in contracts in necessaries in all various actions and in the passions preserving to every one that which is fit and decorous all these things however appear to be human some things likewise appear to happen from the body and the virtue of manners is in many instances conjoined and rendered familiar with the passions prudence also is conjoined with the virtue of manners and the virtue of manners with prudence since the principles indeed of prudence subsist according to the ethical virtues and the rectitude of the ethical virtues subsists according to prudence these however are connected with the passions and will subsist about the composite or that which consists of soul and body but the virtues of the composite are human the life therefore and the felicity conformable to them will also be human the felicity however of intellect is separate for thus much may be asserted concerning it since to discuss it accurately is a greater undertaking than is adapted to the present treatise it would also seem that this felicity requires but little of external supply or less than ethical felicity for let it be admitted that both require necessaries and this equally bracket though the political character labours in a greater degree about the body and things of this kind close bracket since this is but of small consequence yet it makes a great difference with respect to energies for the liberal man will be in want of wealth in order to perform liberal deeds and also the just man in order to make retributions for the wills of men are immanifest and those who are not just pretend they wish to act justly but the brave man will be in want of power in order to effect something conformable to the virtue of fortitude and the temperate man will be in want of the means of acting temperately for how will this man or he who possesses any one of the other virtues become manifest it becomes however an object of inquiry whether deliberate choice possesses greater authority in virtue or whether it is possessed by actions virtue subsisting in both these it is evident therefore that the perfect will be in both but many things are requisite to the perfection of actions and in proportion as they are greater and more beautiful a greater number of things are necessary to him however who energizes according to theoretic virtue there is no need of things of this kind so far as pertains to this energy but as i may say they are impediments to his contemplation yet so far as he is a man and lives with many others he also chooses to perform actions conformable to virtue he will therefore require external things in order that he may act like a man but that perfect felicity is a certain contemplative energy may become apparent from hence that we consider the gods to be especially blessed and happy what kind of actions however is it fit to ascribe to them shall we say just actions or will they not appear ridiculous if they form contracts and return deposits and do other things of the like kind shall we say then that they are brave sustaining things of a terrible nature and encountering dangers because it is beautiful so to do or that they are liberal but to whom will they give it would however be absurd to suppose that there is money with them or anything of this kind and if they are temperate what will this temperance be or is not the praise an apt which celebrates them as not having depraved desires but if we should enumerate everything pertaining to actions it would appear to be small and unworthy of the gods all men however acknowledge that they live and therefore that they energize for it must not be supposed that they pass their life in sleep like endymion 
Hence, if action is taken away from that which lives, and in a still greater degree production, what remains except contemplation? So that the energy of God, since it excels in blessedness, will be contemplative. And of human energies, therefore, that which is most allied to this energy of God will be most adapted to procure felicity. But as an indication of the truth of this, other animals which are perfectly deprived of an energy of this kind do not partake of felicity. For the whole life of the gods is indeed blessed, but that of men is blessed so far as they possess a certain similitude of such an energy as this. Of other animals, however, no one is happy, because they do not in any respect participate of contemplation. As far, therefore, as contemplation extends itself, so far also is felicity extended. And the felicity of those beings is greater, in whom there is more of the contemplative energy. And this not from accident, but according to contemplation, for this is of itself honorable. Hence felicity will be a certain contemplation. External prosperity, however, will be requisite to him who energizes according to theoretic virtue, since he is a man. For human nature is not sufficient to itself for the purposes of contemplation. But it is also requisite that the body should be well, and that it should be supplied with food and other necessaries. It must not, however, be supposed that because it is not possible for a man to be blessed without external goods, a happy man will therefore require many of these, and such as are great. For neither a condition of being sufficient to itself, nor judgment, nor action, consists in an excess of external goods. But it is possible for those who have no dominion over the earth and sea to perform beautiful deeds, since a man, from moderate possessions, may be able to act according to virtue. The truth of this, however, may be clearly seen, for private persons appear to act no less equitably, but even more so, than potentates. But moderate possessions are sufficient for this purpose, for the life of him will be happy who energizes according to virtue and Solon, perhaps, well defined those who are happy by saying that they are such as are moderately furnished with external possessions, and who perform the most beautiful actions, and live temperately, since it is possible for those whose possessions are but moderate to do those things which ought to be done. Anaxagoras, likewise, appears to have thought that the happy man was neither the rich man nor the potentate, when he says, quote, that it would not be at all wonderful if I should be considered by the multitude as an absurd and miserable man. Close quote. For the multitude judge from external circumstances, having a sensible perception of these alone. The opinions also of the wise seem to accord with these assertions. Things of this kind, therefore, are attended with a certain credibility. A judgment, however, is to be formed of the truth in practical affairs from deeds and the life. For in these, that which possesses principal authority consists. Hence, it is requisite to consider what has been before said, by referring it to the deeds and the life of a man. And when the assertions accord with deeds, they are to be admitted. But when they are dissonant, they are to be considered as nothing but words. But the man who energizes according to intellect, who cultivates this, and is mentally disposed in the best manner, is also, it would seem, most dear to divinity. For if any attention is paid by the gods to human affairs, as it appears there is, it is also reasonable to suppose that they will be delighted with that which is most excellent and most allied to themselves, but this is intellect, and likewise that they will remunerate those who especially love and honor this, as taking care of that which is dear to themselves, and acting rightly and well. It is, however, not immanifest that all these things are especially present with the wise man, Hence, he is the most dear to divinity. It is also probable that the same man is most happy, so that thus also the wise man will be especially happy. Chapter 9 Are we therefore to think that if these things and the virtues, and likewise friendship and pleasure, have been sufficiently delineated, our purpose is completely effected? Or shall we say, as has been before observed, that the end in practical affairs is not to survey and know each particular, but rather to perform it? Neither, therefore, is it sufficient in virtue to know it, but there should also be an endeavor to possess and use it, or in some other way must we strive to become good men? If, therefore, words were sufficient of themselves to make men worthy, they ought justly, 
as Theognis says, to be valued at a great price, and it would be necessary to procure them. Now, however, they appear to be sufficiently powerful to exhort and excite liberal young men, and to make those whose manners are noble, and who are truly lovers of beautiful conduct, obedient to virtue. But they are incapable of exhorting the multitude to probity. For the multitude are not naturally adapted to be obedient from shame, but from fear, nor to abstain from bad conduct through the disgrace with which it is attended, but through punishment. For, living from passion, they pursue their pleasures, and those things through which they may be procured, but they avoid the pains opposed to these. They have not, however, any conception of that which is beautiful in conduct and truly delectable, in consequence of not having tasted of it. What discourse, therefore, can dispose such men to orderly conduct? For it is not possible, or at least it is not easy, to obliterate by words things which have been for a long time impressed in the manners. But perhaps we must be satisfied, if everything being present with us, through which we are accustomed to become worthy, we may be able to partake of virtue. Some, however, are of opinion that men become good from nature, others that they become good from custom, and others from doctrine. As to goodness from nature, therefore, it is evident that this is not in our power, but that it is inherent in those who are truly fortunate, through a certain divine cause. But it must be considered whether it is not true that words and precepts are not accompanied with power towards all men. But it is requisite that the soul of the auditor should have been previously excited by manners to rejoice and hate properly, like land which is intended to nourish seed. For he who lives under the influence of passion will not attend to the reasoning which dissuades him from such a life. How, therefore, is it possible to induce one who is so disposed to alter his mode of conduct? In short, passion does not appear to yield to reason, but to violence. Hence it is necessary that manners should pre-exist in a certain respect appropriate to virtue, in order that their possessor may love what is beautiful, and be indigent with what is disgraceful in conduct. To obtain, however, a right education for virtue from our youth is difficult, without being nurtured by laws which enforce the offices of virtue. For to live temperately and accustomed to endurance is not pleasing to the multitude, and especially to youth. Hence it is necessary that education, studies, and pursuits should be ordained by laws, for by custom they will cease to be painful. But perhaps it is not sufficient for youth to obtain a right education, and to have proper attention paid to them. But it is also necessary, when they have arrived at the perfection of manhood, that they should study and be accustomed to these things. And in these we shall likewise require the assistance of the laws, and in short, through the whole of life. For the multitude are more obedient to necessity than to reason, and to punishment than to the beautiful in conduct. Hence some persons are of the opinion that legislators ought indeed to excite men to virtue, and exhort them to it for the sake of the beautiful in conduct, because worthy men will precedaneously from their manners obey their exhortations. But that castigations and punishments should be inflicted on those who disobey them, and who are naturally more unapt, and that the incurable should be entirely exterminated from the community. For, say they, the worthy man, and he who lives with a view to the beautiful in conduct, will be obedient to reason. But the bad man who aspires after pleasure is to be punished by pain, like a beast of burden. Hence, they add, it is necessary that such pains should be employed, as are especially contrary to the pleasures which they embrace. If, therefore, as we have said, it is requisite that he who is to be a good man should be well educated and accustomed to virtuous conduct, and afterwards should thus live in worthy studies and pursuits, and neither unwillingly nor willingly perform base deeds. And if these things may happen to those who live conformably to certain intellect and right order, possessing power and strength, if this be the case, the paternal mandate indeed is neither accompanied with strength, nor necessity, nor in short the mandate of one man, unless he is a king, or a person endued with a similar authority, but the law possesses a necessarily compelling power, being a mandate proceeding from a certain prudence and intellect. And those indeed who are adverse to the impulses of depraved men, though they are right in so doing, are hated by the multitude. Law, however, when it ordains what is equitable, is not attended with molestation. But in the city of the Lacedaemonians alone, the legislator appears to have paid attention to education and studies, 
or pursuits, while in most cities things of this kind are neglected, and every one, after the manner of the Cyclops, lives as he pleases. Quote, By these no statutes and no rights are known, no council held, no monarch fills the throne, but high on hills or airy cliffs they dwell, or deep in caves whose entrance leads to hell. Each rules his race, his neighbor not his care, heedless of others, to his own severe. Close quote. It is best, therefore, that a common and right attention should be paid to the citizens, and that there should be an ability of effecting this. But if these things are neglected in common, it would seem to be fit that every one should contribute to the promotion of his children and friends in virtue, or should predetermine to do so. From what has been said, however, it would seem that this may especially be effected by him who possesses the power of a legislator. For attentions to the general welfare are effected through the laws, but equitable attentions are accomplished through worthy men. It does not, however, seem to make any difference whether the laws are written or unwritten, nor whether one person or many are disciplined by them, as neither does it make any difference in music and gymnastic and other disciplines. For, as in cities legal institutions and manners are efficacious, so in families paternal mandates and manners, and they are still more efficacious on account of alliance, and the benefits conferred by parents on their children. For children previous to these mandates loved their parents, and are naturally disposed to be obedient to them. Farther still, private differs from public education, in the same manner as in medicine particular differ from universal prescriptions. For universally, indeed, abstinence and quiet are advantageous to one who has a fever, but to this particular person perhaps they are not. And he who is a master in the pugilistic art will not perhaps enjoin the same mode of fighting to all his pupils. It would seem, however, that particulars will be more accurately managed when private attention is paid to them, for then each individual will in a greater degree obtain that which is adapted to him. But the physician, the master of gymnastic exercises, and every other artist, will in the best manner pay attention to an individual, if they know universally what is beneficial to all persons or to persons of a certain description. For sciences are said to be, and are in reality, of that which is common. Nothing, however, perhaps hinders, but that a man may pay attention to one certain thing, in a proper manner, though he is destitute of science, while he accurately surveys from experience what happens to each particular thing. Just as some persons appear to be most excellent physicians to themselves, but are unable to give medical assistance to another person, Perhaps, however, it would seem notwithstanding this to be no less requisite for him who wishes to become an artist, and to be theoretic, to proceed to that which is universal, and to know this as far as it can be known, for we have already observed that sciences are conversant with this. Perhaps also it is requisite that he who wishes to make others better by the attention which he pays to them, whether they be many or few, should endeavor to become skilled in legislation, if we can be rendered good men through the laws. Hence it is not the province of any casual person to render some man, or one committed to his care, fitly disposed to become virtuous. But if it belongs to any one to effect this, it is the province of the man of science, just as in medicine, and the other arts, to which a certain attention and prudence pertain. It is requisite, therefore, after this to consider whence, or how a man may acquire a legislative skill. Or in other arts, is this to be learned from those who are conversant with the management of public affairs? For this appears to be a part of the political science. Or shall we say that a similar thing does not seem to take place in the political science, and the other sciences and powers? For in the others, the same persons are seen to impart the powers, and to energize from them, as is evident in physicians and painters. But the sophists profess indeed to teach politics, yet no one of them acts in a political capacity. And it would seem that those who are engaged in the management of public affairs do this by a certain power and experience, rather than by the exercise of the reasoning faculty. For they do not appear either to write or speak about things of this kind, though perhaps this would be better than to compose forensic or popular orations. Nor again is it seen that they have made either their own children political characters, or some other children of their friends. 
it is reasonable however to suppose that they would have done this if they had been able for neither could they have left anything better to cities nor could they have deliberately chosen anything more excellent than this power either for themselves or their dearest friends nevertheless experience appears to contribute in no small degree to the management of public affairs for otherwise men would not become more political through being accustomed to political affairs hence experience seems to be necessary to those who desire to be skilful in the political science those sophists however who profess to teach the political science appear to be very far from possessing this ability for in short they neither know what kind of a thing it is nor what the things are with which it is conversant for if they did they would not suppose it to be the same with the rhetorical art or inferior to it nor would they think it easy for him to act the part of a legislator who has collected the most celebrated and approved laws since they say that the best laws are to be selected just as if the selection did not require intelligence or as if to judge rightly was not one of the greatest of things in the same manner as in what pertains to music for skilful men judge rightly respecting the works in which they are skilled and understand through what means or in what manner they may be accomplished and what the appropriate adaptations of them are but to the unskilful it is sufficient not to be ignorant whether a work is well or ill done in the same manner as in the painter's art laws however resemble political works how therefore can any one be adapted to become a legislator from these or to judge which of them are the best for neither does it appear that men become skilled in medicine by reading medical books though these books not only endeavour to point out the cures but likewise the remedies which are to be applied and the methods of cure distinguishing also the habits of each person it seems however that these things are beneficial to skilful persons but useless to the unscientific perhaps therefore collections of laws and politics may be useful to those who are able to survey and judge what is well established or the contrary and what the appropriate adaptations are in these but those who discuss things of this kind without the political habit will never be able to judge well except from chance though perhaps they will become more intelligent in these particulars since therefore the politicians prior to us have omitted to investigate legislation it will perhaps be better for us to consider it more attentively and in short to discuss a polity universally in order that the philosophy which pertains to human affairs may as much as possible be brought to perfection in the first place therefore if anything has been well said by the ancients on this subject we shall endeavour to relate it in the next place from the collections which have been made of polities we shall endeavour to survey what the nature is of the things which preserve and corrupt cities and the several polities and from what causes some of them are well but others ill governed for these things being surveyed perhaps we shall be able in a greater degree to perceive what kind of polity is the best how each is to be arranged and what laws and manners it should use we shall begin therefore the discussion of politics End of Book 10 End of the Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle Translated by Thomas Taylor Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards